When we're creating stories in games, we're not just telling a story, we're creating an architecture for a story to exist in. So there's always a player-shaped hole at the centre of the system. What we want the player to do is to parachute in and begin telling the story themselves. And one of the things you learn quite quickly is that there's nothing you can do, there's no tool you have at your disposal which is as powerful as the player's imagination. So the most powerful way you can deliver a story in a game is to inspire the player to really take ownership of it and to really get into that co-authorship thing where actually it's a, it's a collaboration between you and what you produce and what the player does when they're inside there telling a story to themselves. Traditionally in games there's always been a separation between game and story. So you'd have a bit of gameplay where you're moving around and doing a thing and then you'd stop and there'd be a very cinematic cutscene which would tell a bit of story and then you'd be free to act again. And really that's the, the least interesting thing you can do with the medium. What I think is really interesting about games is that on one hand absolutely nothing is real. So there is no world, there's no physical presence to it at all, but at the same time Games are incredibly powerful at giving you a sense of embodiment. The idea of feeling as if you're physically present. So emotions come from a, a physical process in the body. And so if you have a strong sense of agency, of ownership, of being there in the game, you're going to have a much more powerful emotional response to what's going on. I suspect we'll never find her. Not until this whole thing blows over. What is certain is that for the time being, none of us are going anywhere. Visual and auditory distortions are becoming more frequent. The other traditional model is branching narratives, where the story progresses for a while and then you present the player with a choice about where to go next. You can go to the basketball court, you can go to the shed, or in terms of a character you can respond angrily or you can respond sympathetically. We're much more interested in a model where Actually what you're doing is you're, you're giving the player building blocks and you're saying there's all these possible ways in which this story could come together. It's up to you to put those together in your way. So fundamentally you're telling your story rather than being asked to solve the problems of mine. When you're making a game world you're very often constraining the players. So you're building an environment to more or less dictate where it is they can go. And when you're constructing mechanics you're doing a similar thing with their possible actions. You're constraining them, telling them what they can do. But there's one thing which you absolutely can't do, and that's tell someone how to feel. If you start constraining the emotional space around a player, then all of those great things you can do as a storyteller are lost. Heading into the future, we've got virtual reality, and we've just started working on a VR project, and it's really interesting how it forces you to question those ideas about storytelling that, that exist in the medium. So, for example, for a whole bunch of technical reasons, it's incredibly difficult to use text in mobile VR. So you're having to move away again from that cinematic mode of storytelling into something that's really quite different. And that fits really nicely with the models of storytelling we've been exploring. But fundamentally it's still part of the same process. We create these systems for you to be in the centre of as a player, that you can own what we build, you can take it, you can interpret it, you can inhabit it, and it becomes your story that you're telling, it becomes your journey that you're on. So in a weird kind of way, even as we're heading towards the future, what we're actually doing is heading back towards the oldest forms of storytelling of all. <laughs>